So while you are reading the title of my talk, I'm reading your mind. I bet that most of you would like to know by the, by the end of this talk whether they have a, a high carbohydrate tolerance gene or a low carbohydrate tolerance gene. But before I address this uh, unexpressed wish, uh, we should probably define what is carbohydrate tolerance. Uh, so a previous study uh, from my group at Stanford, led by Professor Christopher Gardner, showed that people that uh, have high insulin resistant, resistance uh, have a worse response to a, a low fat, high carbohydrate diet. So insulin resistance can be a measure, one possible measure of carbohydrate tolerance. But are there other factors that describe and can uh, uh, enable the measurement of carbohydrate tolerance? This is the question that we are trying to uh, address in our current study, the uh, largest study ever undertaken to compare low-carb and low-fat diets with uh, 600 uh, um, overweight uh, men and women um, that are randomized to either a low-carb or a, a low-fat diet, which they follow for one year. Uh, the name of the study is Diet FITS, Diet Intervention Examining the Factors Interacted with Treatment Success. So, in a nutshell, we want to identify the factors that can predict whether a person is more likely to respond well to a, a low carbohydrate or a, a low fat diet. So the factors that make us metabolically unique. And so I'm going to ask you now, what, what makes us unique? What do you think? What are the major factors making us unique? Yeah, I love, I <laughs> I love all your answers. Um, and uh, so let's start with DNA. Genes um, are certainly very important to determine who we are. Uh, we don't have dog genes, so we don't look like dogs. Um, but genes can actually explain uh, um, a very tiny percentage of what makes us unique. So let's demonstrate this with a quick experiment. Now, um, I would like you to turn to the person sitting next to you and look at this person carefully. I know it's, uh, it feels awkward, but you are doing this in the name of science. So go ahead and uh, don't worry too much. So. Um, now, be ready for a, a shocking surprise. <laughs> uh, DNA-wise, you are 99.9% similar to the person sitting next to you. So technically speaking, DNA can explain only 0.1% of what makes us unique. And this was one of the shocking surprises from the Human Genome Project, which was completed in 2000. There are other two shocking surprises. The second one being that genes account for only 2% of your DNA. The remaining DNA wa uh, was once called junk DNA be because it doesn't contains ge contain genes uh, and uh, uh, there was the assumption, assumption that no gene means no function. And the third shocking surprise is that uh, we humans have the same number of genes as um, mice, worms, and fruit flies, and 50 times fewer than an onion. So how we get 
along as a species with fewer genes than an onion. There must be something else that explains what makes us human and unique. And as many of you guessed here, these factors are our metabolites, the proteins in our body, mic microbes, and lifestyle factors. Things like diet, exercise, sleep, relationships, emotions, that uh, affect the way we use our genes to a process called epigenetics. And these are the factors that uh, contribute to our metabolic fingerprint and the, factor, the factors that we are investigating in our study. In the next 20 minutes, I will give you an overview of uh, the genetic and epigenetic component of this study on which I'm directly working. So a previous study from my group, the same one I mentioned you before, the A to Z study, identified, uh, so found out that three gene variants, ADRB2, FABP2, and PPAR gamma, uh, might uh, predict um, uh, the predisposition of a person to uh, lose more weight on a low carbohydrate versus a low fat diet. So might be good markers of carbohydrate tolerance. Now, these three gene variants are technically single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs for short. SNPs are what make us unique DNA wise. Do you remember our first shocking surprise? So SNPs explain that 0.1% that um, make, makes you different from the person sitting next to you. And this is because on average, different people have one nucleotide difference every 1,000 nucleotide in the DNA. So this is 0.1%. And now to understand how SNPs work biologically, we have a very quick genetics refresher. So the letters in uh, your DNA sequence provide information to produce amino acids that in turn forms the protein that build up your cells. Now, uh, by changing one nucleotide in the DNA sequence, SNPs might change one amino acid of the protein produced by a gene. And these, together with lifestyle and epigenetics, can affect the way you look, your skin color, your height, your predisposition to diseases, and the way you metabolize food and drugs. Now, coming back to our study, had identified these three SNPs uh, that were very good candidates as biomarker to predict carbohydrate tolerance. Uh, these genes are all involved in uh, fat storage and glucose metabolism. So we went and tested whether we could replicate the association between and carbohydrate tolerance is in this new study. And actually, we couldn't. So this reflects a general problem with genetic testing. Common SNPs have small effects on function. They can usually explain 1% of the variability between people. So knowing that you are carrying one SNP or a couple of SNPs usually doesn't provide any meaningful information about the your visible traits or your health. And so, for example, according to 23andMe, I am 72% likely to have straight hair. <laughs> and so, and there is, uh, and the reason for that is that genes don't work in isolation, but in large networks. So um, a, um, a researcher at Stanford, uh, Jonathan uh, uh, Pritchard, um, published a paper a couple of weeks ago where um, 
he says that most traits are omnigenic, which means that they are influenced by thousand SNPs spanning the entire genome. So even uh, traits uh, which have a high genetic component, like hair curliness or height, are influenced by thousand genes. So height actually is affected by 300,000 SNPs. And most of these sh shifted by just a seventh of a millimeter. There's no way you can predict your height just by looking at 10 SNPs. So, and this is the first problem with genetic testing. The second problem is that they don't account for environmental factors, which is epigenetics. So in the second part of my talk, I will uh, uh, introduce you to the field of epigenetics, um, explain how diet can affect epigenetics, and uh, um, uh, give you an introduction about the work we are doing in our study. So um, uh, epigenetics is one of the most exciting field of science today. Um, in 2010, the Time magazine dedicated an entire issue to it. The cover story, why your DNA isn't your destiny. The new science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. And since then, epigenetics is showing up in more and more places, in our kitchen, in our supplements, in our face creams. But what are the facts and fantasies about epigenetics? So let's try to disentangle these things together and start from the basics. So epigenetics from the Greek epi, which means on the top, means on the top of genetics. So if your uh, uh, DNA is your genome, then your epigenome is a second genome, um, uh, which is on the top of your DNA and is made of molecular switches that can turn genes on and off, just like a dimmer switch can modulate lights up and down in a room. Uh, this uh, process of turning genes on and off, up and down, is called gene expression. And it can explain why there are different types of cells in our body. Fat cells, neuron cells, liver cells, all told 300 different types of cells that all have the same DNA. How is, is this possible? Think of the genome as a hardware. The epigenome is a software that tells each of your cells what to do, which, which genes to turn on and off. So therefore, each single cell in the body has a different epigenome. And uh, now scientists have sequenced 111 out of the possible 300 and more epigenomes in our body. And this was the result of another landmark project called the Roadmap Epigenomics Project, which is still ongoing. And uh, another finding from this project is that most epigenetic marks lay outside the genes what was once called junk DNA. So they are hidden gold in the junk, and they can partly explain the paradox that we introduced before, that we have 50 times fewer genes than an onion. We can make uh, more out of our genome because we have a more complex epigenome. So epigenetics, is not only what makes us human, but also can explain in part what makes us unique. Uh, and uh, this is how lifestyle factors can send signals to enzymes inside our cells that write or erase epigenetic markers. And these in turn affect, can affect gene expression. Now, you can think, therefore, 
of epigenetic markers as uh, memo nodes placed on your genes. These memo nodes store information about your lifestyle, your environment, and this process is called epigenetic memory. Epigenetic memory can explain why, for example, identical twins with exactly the same DNA can start differing with time, uh, not only in the way they look, but also in the pre their predisposition to diseases. And uh, epigenetic memory is also key to understanding how our lifestyle can uh, change our gene expression, thus affecting our health and disease. And this is because the notes, the memo notes that are taken before our birth tend to be written with a pen, to be permanent. That's why it's so important the nutrition of the mother and the prenatal environment. And the notes that are taken after our birth tend to be written with the pencil, to be potentially reversible. And this is where your lifestyle, your choices become very important because this pencil is in your hands. And diet is one of the most potent signals to our genes. There are many studies um, uh, in animal models and human um, showing this, but maybe the most um, famous example comes from uh, an, a historic tragedy, the Dutch hunger winter in 1944. So in 1944, uh, during World War II, um, the Germans imposed uh, a food uh, embargo on uh, Holland, in Holland, and as a consequence, 20,000 people died. And uh, the babies born during the famine had were born uh, underweight, of course, and had very severe health issues. And this is not a surprise. What is a surprise is that when these babies grew up, they were highly prone to obesity and to psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia. And even more surprising, when the famine babies had children of their own, these were also born underweight and with high predisposition to become obese, even if they were never exposed directly to the famine. So some scientists wonder whether um, the famine uh, could have left some pen marks on the epigenome of the famine babies. And uh, um, what they found out is that even six decades later, after the famine, the famine babies had different epigenetics, uh, epigenetic modification compared uh, with the, uh, their same sex siblings who uh, weren't exposed to the famine. And one of these modification uh, marks uh, was uh, in a gene that promotes growth in the, in the womb, uh, IGF-2. Uh, so this study clearly shows that uh, you are what you eat and maybe also what your mother and grandmother hate. But also fathers should, be, um, should pay attention to what they eat. Uh, because this might alt also affect uh, the epigenome of their children. A study from 2015 shows that obese men have different epigenetic marks compared with the uh, uh, lean men, and these marks uh, um, are uh, um, in uh, their sperm cells, so they could potentially pass to next generation, and they are found in uh, genes that regulate brain function and uh, appetite. So these two examples really show us that food is not only calories, but also information. It's information that can change the expression of our genes. And in our study, I'm trying to understand whether these changes of gene in gene 
ethics can help us um, understand um, whether, so predict whether a person is going to respond better to a low carb or low fat diet. And so if whether we can use these epigenetic marks as biomarkers for uh, um, carbohydrate tolerance. So our approach is to compare the high responders and the low responders to uh, a high carbohydrate diet and then uh, um, the um, epigenetic markers that um, will be specific of the high responders will be markers of, of high carbohydrate tolerance, whereas those that are specific low responders will be a marker of low carbohydrate tolerance. Now, I, um, I have to um, stress uh, an important difference between genetic uh, and epigenetic markers in your, in your journey to optimal health. Because you cannot change your genes, genetic markers can only tell you where your starting line was. But because epigenetic markers respond dynamically to the environment and lifestyle, Epigenetic biomarkers can tell you where you are now in your journey to optimal health. And uh, this is also what our data suggests. I, we are in the process of analyzing the data. I cannot share any uh, specific details, but I can tell you that what we see is that your carbohydrate tolerance may depend on your carb history. So how many carbs are you eating now and you have been eating before? And uh, this history is stored as an information in uh, your epigenetic marks. And these marks may be potentially reversible. So when you lose weight and when you do change your uh, carb intake, these markers change. And your carbohydrate tolerance can change as well. And uh, there are studies already published that uh, point to this um, hypothesis. Um, uh, for example, this is a study from last year uh, showing that carbohydrate intakes affects epigenetic marks that influence uh, then carbohydrate tolerance. In this case was uh, an epigenetic mark in a clock gene, um, uh, the uh, uh, BMAL1. But this is just detail, but it's just to say that science is showing that um, our carbohydrate tol tolerance is not something that is set in stone, but is more dynamic than we used to think. Um, and I, um, there are many studies supporting this hypothesis. I reviewed them in a recent uh, open access uh, review that I published just a couple of months ago in the journal Epigenomics, so you are encouraged to check it out. And, um, and so to... Uh, end up this um, uh, talk, I would like to leave you with two important messages. The first one is uh, use your genes, don't let them use you. And the second one is that we are truly unique in two ways. Because of our genes, the book we are born with, and because our epigenome, the book, the book you are, the author of. So and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I was on time. <laughs> great, great. So please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Great talk. Aren't there theoretical reasons to be a little bit skeptical of like epigenetic uh, programming transgenerationally. Transgener like, we don't really know what the weather is going to be like next year. So, for uh, much less what the nutrient availability is going to be like in the lifetime of a, a long living organism. Perhaps a shorter lifespan organism, an insect or a, or a rodent, the predictive adaptive response would make sense, right? Because it's less, you're, le you're predicting less into the future. But do we think that that happens transgenerationally? So you are asking me what is the evidence of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance? 
Yeah, especially in long-lived organisms. Yes, yes. Okay, so what, for example, the study I showed you doesn't necessarily mean that this was a transgenerational uh, epigenetic inheritance. And the reason for that is um, that we have to uh, distinguish be between in utero effects and epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. The transgenerational inheritance is something that happens through the sperm or egg cells, okay? The in utero effects can be direct effects during due to exposure of, uh, um, of the baby. So the baby, um, because the problem is that, especially for women, this is a problem. My, the egg that produced me was laid by my grandmother, okay? So if my grandmother was exposed to the famine, I might have been directly affected by the famine, not through the germline, so not through transgenerational epi epigenetic inheritance, but through in utero effects. So the experiment that I showed you doesn't demonstrate a transgenerational inheritance because we should go to the fourth generation and test this, right? So we don't have uh, um, a proof for that in for human studies. And this is because we just need to go further and demonstrate that these, these uh, modifications are truly permanent after the fourth generation. But there are uh, studies, especially mice, uh, showing this. They went over the fourth generation and demonstrating uh, that there is an effect. Actually, a professor working uh, here, Michael Skinner, did an um, important experiment in mice um, showing this. Um, and for humans, no, there is not a, a definitive answer. So we don't know if these are in utero effects. This epigenetics is surely involved. We just don't know if it's a transgenerational inheritance or in utero effects. So yes, this is a, a good question. Uh, on the low carb cruise, uh, when I heard your I talk, remember you. uh, yes, one thing I uh, liked, and I don't know if this falls under what you can't talk about now due to the uh, the analysis, but you discussed how having a low carbohydrate tolerance may be a benefit. Is that is that off limits right now? Yeah, I thought, <laughs> yeah, I was I was discussing Details. an example. Yeah, so actually one of the SNPs that I showed you, um, that um, that SNP actually uh, was in uh, ADRB two, I think. The day uh, uh, anyone uh, anyway was one of the SNP that I showed you the uh, ADRB two, but basically makes the gene works better. So respond uh, better to insulin. As a, as a result, uh, your uh, uh, this gene produce um, uh, is a sort of fat plug that allows your fat uh, fat cell to release fatty acids and burn them as a fuel. Plug respond to um, adrenaline, but also to insulin. So and uh, this SNP actually makes the plug work better. So um, it responds better to insulin and it um, was useful for us during the vacation because we were going through period of starvation and uh, feeding and uh, so this was only to point out that SNPs, we, we think of SNPs as something uh, uh, that uh, is pathological but is actually they just reflect long-term adaptation of the DNA sequence to allow us to thrive better in response to environmental changes. So they're actually part of a, a natural mechanism that to prevent disease and not to cause disease. So I think this was, yes, the point I was trying to make. And I think this is very important because we see this over and over, especially now with the, um, with the rays of personal genomics. You hear about uh, MTHFR, APOE4, and blah, blah, blah. All these are gene variants, and most of these variants are actually associated with uh, protective effects. 
in other so they sometimes they they, they, they make you um, they predispose you for one condition but they protect you for one wha one one other one one other and they are s they are not rare they affect 25 percent of the population 50 percent sometimes so they are not disease causing genes uh, so yeah thank you for uh, for making this question uh, just something interesting what you mentioned about the um from the Dutch hunger winter and the thrifty phenotype hypothesis of Barker, which obviously you know about, um, is that there's reasonable evidence to suggest that, well, calorie deprivation in utero triggers the baby's epigenome to anticipate a lifetime of starvation. That's, that's the high, and then when they get access to lots of calories like they did after World War II, their their metabolism was trained to store it and keep it, and they developed all those problems in midlife. Well, um, oxygen is uh, we call it a respiratory nutrient or a respiratory substrate. Oxygen deprivation in utero, as is what's seen when women who are pregnant and they snore and have apnea. Um, we're speculating that it's a similar uh, sort of phenomenon that the metabolism is adjusted because the fetus thinks it's going to be born on top of Mount Everest. And they're born shorter, like mountain, mountainous indigenous people are, because of the largest uh, reservoir of mitochondria is in the musculoskeletal system, so it behooves them to be short. So I just wanted to bring that up, that it might, I know Gary Taub's likes to attack new things so maybe oh thank you very <laughs> much for bringing this up i think that this is the beauty of the field is ever growing i was not actually aware of this but there are scientists that are studying uh, how many many um uh, yeah conditions can affect epigenetics so this is actually exciting i didn't know so thank thank you very much for bringing this up are you working in the field okay Yes, thank you. Question? <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, three years ago, I uh, went to the uh, University of Camerino and took, uh, well, they were talking about nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics. I wonder if that uh, summer school is still going on and whether you are going to be a part of it or you or anyone uh, from your team in the next uh, summer school. Uh, thanks a lot for telling me about it because as you may know, I may imagine, so I'm a, on one side I'm a typical scientist. I work in the lab in my science, so I'm not aware of these things, but I just created a, an online course for the Stanford Continuing Study Program in Nutrigenomics. So I would be very interested to be there. And Nutrigenomics and Nutrigenetics is, so what he's speaking about is this even and take these conversations between our genes and environment. Nutrigenetics is how our genes, our SNPs, can affect the way we process food. And Nutrigenomics is the opposite process how the food we eat can modify the activity of our genes through epigenetics. And this is a fascinating uh, field, I think. Uh, um, although science is still growing, we don't, we don't know a lot yet. Um, but every time I give this course, I, I'm, um, I'm very happy to see that people are empowered because they, they to take action or, or their life on their life because they see that science is just explaining what we have known for years that you should like uh, exercise and, uh, and, and a good diet help. But now that th they see that this is evidence-based, they are really encouraged to take ac action. And I think this is also one positive aspect of personal genomics. So I told you that is not so useful yet. But on the other side, some people need to know that they have the MTHFR gene 
to go and eat their spinach. It's sometimes it can be useful because uh, and, and studies show that providing genetic information actually can uh, uh, enhance so uh, diet adherence and uh, you know people eat better. So there is a uh, there is a good use for that. So maybe you can tell me more about this program. I will be I would love to. Thank you. I thought I heard you say that there are epigenetic markers that you are born with that you really can't do anything about. Is that true? So there's nothing. So if your mother was a chronic dieter, or you were born to a family who was multiple uh, generations of junk food eaters, there's nothing you can do about that except try to do better for the future generation. Okay, for, so first of all, I, I tried as you to make also things simple in my uh, presentation and sometimes, yeah, this doesn't reflect the complexity of things. So um, it is true that the, uh, um, all these um, statement, statements are uh, based mostly on uh, studies from animals and we do see that in general there are some epigenetic changes that occur before birth and they are not reversible. We don't know what makes written in pen versus in pencil. Of course, one uh, factor for that is that uh, before birth, we are um, more sensitive to environmental signals because after when the sperm and the egg fuse together, actually all the epigenetic marks are erased not all this is also another but most of them are erased so you are mo uh, almost epigenetically naked the embryo the stem cells in the embryo are epigenetically naked that's that was uh, that that is what stem cells are they are epigenetically naked cells that can become everything because they don't have the epigenetic marks they don't have the program to say, okay, you express these genes and you don't express these genes. They can express potentially everything. So because they're epigenetically naked, they are stem cells. But then once they start differentiating and form the tissues of your body, they acquire epigenetic changes. So I'm telling you this to say, okay, you, these cells that are still epi epigenetically naked and they are, they are forming their epigenome, of course they are more sensitive. But there are also some other factors that can explain why some markers are in pen or in pencil. There are some um, sequence, uh, locus specific factors. So some sequencing our in our DNA because of their sequence or because of some DNA elements present in them are more fragile, are more prone to, um, yeah, to, um, to epigenetic changes that are permanent. So anyway, there are stu studies in animals showing that these epigenetic changes are not reversible. I don't know, there, there's nothing sh like that that was shown in man, uh, in a human. So I don't know if we are more protective towards these or just there is no science showing this. Um, so I cannot tell you, but I think likely there are some epigenetic changes and very likely they are anyway compatible to life, so maybe they are not. Um, but most of them, uh, um, there are epigenetic changes that are actually very, very, uh, they happen very quick, so quick that it's very dif difficult to study epigenetic. You have to control. You I may I may have different epigenetic changes. Happy to share this with you. And then uh, you know if you measure my epigenetic changes after the talk, so is this because I had a, a huge breakfast or because I wasn't at, at the talk? We don't know, right? So uh, epigenetics is very dynamic uh, and influenced by the lifestyle factor. Just take the pencil part of my talk and try to <laughs> use that.